Hey everyone, welcome to Fighting Over the Card Catalog, a snarky look back on young adult novels of the 80s and 90s. I'm Jess. I'm Steven, and I'm here to make my wife happy. We're taking a journey to find out how many terrible and hopefully some not so terrible books from my youth I can get my husband to read before he reconsiders this whole marriage. Hi. Hey. What a week. What a week. <laughs> Did you reconsider this whole marriage? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to plead the fifth. Oh, shit! <laughs> <laughs> so, this week we read Last Act by Christopher Pike, <laughs> written in 1988. It was only a high school play until Death walked on stage. Melanie was the new girl in town, a little lonely, a little bored. Then she auditioned for the school play and won the starring role. Suddenly, she had a whole gang of exciting friends. But these friends shared something that Melody did not know, something from the past, something so terrible that none of them would ever talk about it. Until after the play's opening night, when the police came for the body and for Melody. Man, way to like tell the whole plot. I know, I'm right? Like, I'm so glad I didn't see that before I yeah. read this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it the murder happens like halfway through. I mean, half of it is like, you know, Melanie yeah. going around being a stupid ass little investigator. But anyways, why Well it's like I kept wondering, you know, and they they talked about the gun so much, you know, oh, obviously yeah. it had to be part of it, but Oh, we will get to that. Yeah. Okay. But start out. I chose this book this week because today that we're recording, March 27th, also my bestie's birthday. Happy birthday, Jessica. Happy birthday, Jessica. (laughs) Um, Is also World Theater Day. And yeah, I'm a huge theater person and I reread this book quite a bit when I was younger and I loved it. I loved Christopher Pike. Because he was spooky, but like a little more adult than R.L. Stein. Like there's more swearing and almost sex. And this had to do with theater, and it was great, and I loved it. I did not love it this time. No? No, that was fucking terrible. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about you? Aside from it being super long. Yeah. Um, there were a couple of parts where I'm like, ah, oh, teenagers don't talk like that. <laughs> um, but other than that, it was pretty entertaining. Yeah. I oh, really? Entertaining. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'm really surprised by that. Um, because it was new story to me. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, I would say it's the best one we've read so far. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> this is putting a strain on our marriage. <laughs> Even more than Judy Bloom. Yeah, I mean, I've, just because it was new. Just because it was new. Yeah. You know, okay. Because I didn't okay. know the story. Already. Yeah. You looked so goddamn miserable reading it, I though. I was miserable. <laughs> yeah. Having to cram two nights, like <laughs> all night for two nights. Yeah, yeah. That, was, that was miserable. Yeah. Yeah, but at least the story was okay. Okay. I could not tell that by your face. Okay. Well, interesting. Okay, then. From scale of one best book ever to ten being a Dementor's Kiss, sucking the soul from your love of reading. <laughs> I got to go with maybe like three three wow would you have enjoyed it more in like high school junior high i don't know i mean i always wanted to be in theater right when i was a kid right but what you never really had the opportunity we had a couple of school plays um etc but even like i was lo- so looking forward to my senior year because we were going to have one act play yeah and i really wanted to do one act play i was so excited about it and none of the teachers would sponsor it. So they just completely skipped my senior year doing one at play in school. That is so sad. Yeah. And buck wild. Yeah. I bet now Palestine has a great theater program. Well, Palestine Westwood. School had a great yeah. theater program. Like they have its own theater auditorium mm-hmm. that's separate from all, you know, from basketball courts and all right. that stuff no no sharing cafeteria or anything they have their i bet they share with band own dedicated theater room 
And actually, when I went there in, as a freshman, um, I took technical theater. Mm-hmm. Hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which was building sets, doing makeup, uh-huh. doing lighting, mm-hmm. um, all of that fun and great stuff yeah. that you also Yeah, oh, my enjoy. jam. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I really enjoyed it. But uh, yeah, then I went back to Westwood and... and wah, 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 wah. no theater at all. Yeah, no theater wow. program itself. All they had was one act play. But so no class to learn anything no. to do. Okay, no. so I bet they didn't perform very well. You had um, yeah, I guess act. you know because we I had some people in my grade and um, around my grade that uh, did community theater. Mm. Um, so Palestine's community theater is great. Yeah, so there could have. I mean, we would have had some people who were really good mm, yeah and like i took um i did uh debate for uil mm, and yeah. you know i was a, had a partner that did debate also mm. he would have been good uh, mm. and there were there were several people who would have been good but maybe, they didn't get maybe to train not in te- technical aspects but so sad. yeah 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 so anyway the whole reason i was talking about that is i don't mm. know that i would have necessarily um, um, what's the word I'm looking for I don't know it wouldn't have been interesting to you no, when this spoke into uh, you when you feel what the other people are feeling empathized no, no I wouldn't have that's the word related, related. <laughs> <laughs> damn I hate when that happens <laughs> I, I don't know that I would have related so much. Mm. I mean, I could have related to moving to a new school, certainly. Mm. Yeah, maybe I would have liked yeah. it even better in high school. I don't know. I probably would have given it a three I back in the day. I pretty much only read sci-fi right. <laughs> as a teenager. Right, right, right. Um, but yeah, man, I got to give it a seven or eight yeah. now. Yeah. Just just hard, huh? Yeah. In, in what the sense? The writing like? is just really bad. <laughs> And, I mean, I have a lot of issues with the theater stuff itself, which I will get into. (laughs) But, yeah, there was just, like, so much exposition and stuff that, yeah, that's the sort of stuff that bothered me that didn't bother me when I was, like, 12. Yeah, that's like me watching, like, a military movie and being, that's totally, that's totally fake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They would never act like that. That's not how you salute. Exactly. He's wearing his uniform wrong. (laughs) I'm yeah. going to give you a lesson on guns in the theater. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. But okay, let's get into it then. So Melanie is this new-ish girl in school having moved from San Francisco to Careville, Iowa to go to Care High. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> After her parents' divorce. Um, her mom was like a raging bitch who just like did not care for her daughter at all. Um, But her dad's cool, so they moved there together. Um, But she started towards the end of the year prior. It's there during the summer, and now it's fall. So maybe uh, Melanie's mom not caring for her is why Melanie has body issues with herself and other people. Like, I pulled a lot of quotes of what Melanie said. She's like, maybe it's my deodorant or my shampoo. Yeah, I must have dandruff. That explains it, why she doesn't have any friends. But she meets Susan Trells in trig class and helps her cheat after she judges her. Mm. Melanie knew Susan was more attractive than her individual features warranted. Her eyes were pretty blue, but her face, though tan and unblemished, was a bit too round. Her energy was her saving grace. Watching Susan for even a minute, you could tell she got a lot out of life. Plus, she was tall and blonde, and nobody, male or female, could argue about that chest. Since Melanie herself was rather dainty, or flat, depending on her mood, in that area, Susan was not someone who could ordinarily arouse her sympathies. Damn, Melanie! (laughs) You're not arousing my sympathies. I can see how you would focus on a lot of that. I guess I was trying to read so fast and get through it. I wasn't focusing on those little things. But, yeah, I can see. I can see. Yeah. Um, So, but Susan's all grateful for the help, and they have lunch together. 
Um, and but if lunch means more issues because there's food. The cake was tempting, but chocolate carried on in her body like an <laughs> acne virus. Now, is that an old wives' tale, or has that been proven true or false? It's an know? old wives' tale. Okay, I, I um, I'm pretty so. sure Sydney's talked about it on Sawbones. Nah. Yeah, check out Sawbones. That's a great podcast. Great podcast. <laughs> Um, oh, it's also Sydney's birthday. Happy birthday, Sydney birthday, McElroy. Sydney. <laughs> You'll never hear this, but that's fine. <laughs> you know, you listen every week. <laughs> um, okay, and then this is where, yeah, her mom's uh, thoughts really come in. Before the dark ages, I'm guessing of the divorce, her mother had said that she was a born aristocrat, and it was her true face that was fine, and it was true her face was finely structured. The stress of the divorce had caused her to lose weight, making her cheeks somewhat hollow, and this served to emphasize her delicate appearance. Her hair was auburn, short, and shiny, cut in bangs that almost brushed her deep-set hazel eyes. When the sun was bright, her skin dotted with freckles, and after the past summer, quite a few were gathered around her nose. Her lips were her best feature, a deep rosy red and heart-shaped. She seldom used lipstick. Sadly, her teeth, particularly the bottom row, were crooked. When she smiled, she kept her mouth shut. Also, she was short, 5'2 in heels. God damn, she thinks a lot of her. <laughs> Except for her teeth. That was height. a description of herself? Yes. Ah. Yeah. Anyway. So, Susan's super interested in Melly's, Melanie's interest in boys. And she introduces her to Mark, spelled with a C, uh, that Melanie's already been crushing on. Mark's going to be in this play that Susan is directing, which, and we learn a little bit about Melanie's theatrical background. Um, At her old school, she did sets first, which is obviously awesome, for Christmas Carol. And when the ghost of Christmas past had an asthma attack, Melanie went on for her. And then the director kept her on for the entire run. Right. That's not going to happen. I'm sorry. Unless that kid was in the hospital for like forever. Yeah, I was going to say, just fuck that kid. What the fuck? (laughs) So, and then. He did all that work and and he still wasn't any good. So, let's just replace him. And then Peter Pan got appendicitis. So, she got that part too without ever auditioning for Peter fucking Pan. Yeah. And she knew it. Yeah. She. Ten days before they opened. That's a lot of fucking lines yeah. and flying. Yeah. And shit to learn. HQs and, yeah. Yeah. So already I'm like, yeah, I'm having that. <sighs> now, I mean, if she was there doing sets or something and she saw everything, I could see having a jump on it. But Yeah, having a jump on it. Yeah. Sure. Anyways, we meet <laughs> uh, football bro Steve, who wants Mark to come back to the team, but he won't. Uh, we learn about Mark's best friend, Clyde, who used to be quarterback while he was wide receiver. Um, but Clyde got injured. Susie says, Susan, sorry. He'll be all right, but won't play football again. Ominously. Next, we meet Rindy. R-I-N-D-Y. Though Melanie has already met her getting into a fender bender earlier that year. Um, Rindy is rich and beautiful, but everyone thinks she's a snob and doesn't like her. Rindy is short for Marinda or Dorinda, mm. if you were wondering. I've never known a Marinda. I've known a Miranda. Yeah. No, it's Marinda. Susan tells Melanie that she has to audition. The cast didn't like the first choice for a certain role. So she gets into auditions, and apparently the whole fucking set is built already. We learned right. why, at least. And I was like, okay. They borrowed it from a junior college. And so that means, like, the flats and stuff were already built. But they're too big, apparently. And it touches the theater walls. And actors will have to go outside to make some entrances. You want to bet if that's important later on? So she decided to come to audition for three reasons. She got a letter from her old boyfriend breaking up with her. Mark came into the diner where she works, but didn't ask for her number. And her mom called and asked if she was going to take drama, and she said no. And her mom replied with, that doesn't surprise me. (laughs) So, yeah, she showed up at auditions. Uh, First, she meets Carl, the stage manager. And 
she's a little judgy about him too. He comes off as a junior high kid, but he's 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 in high school. Yeah, and that because he was so nice, mm-hmm. um, that immediately made me <laughs> <laughs> wary of him. Yeah, thinking he was going to be the bad guy yeah. in the end. Yeah, he's not at all. He turns out to be a real sweet kid. Um, he's Rindy's little brother, by the way. Um, Susan's directing this play because she struck a deal with a drama teacher that if she gets to direct this, she'll play Blanche for him in A Streetcar Named Desire. Yeah, that's how theater works. (laughs) Then she meets Rodney Rosenberg, also there to audition. He is uptight and rude as hell. But he's actually named Jeremy. He's just playing his character offstage. Um, But he is like... The overly flamboyant, like, I'm an actor kid every high school theater group has. He wants to make sure you know he's a little bit weird and flamboyant at all times. There's always one of those kids. Um, And he's also constantly taking pictures. We meet Tracy, and she's a mediocre actress. (laughs) Tracy lets, uh, this is going to get so confusing with names, even though I have it written down. She tells Melanie that... Um, Susan could have been referring to herself about playing Melissa that Melanie's there to audition for. Um, she mentioned playing Melissa, but we all thought that would be too much with her directing and all. Trust me, yeah, that's a very bad idea to try and direct what you're also in. Yeah. I haven't done it myself, but I've been in a show where it kind of had to happen and it was not great. Yeah. <laughs> So, some other girls auditioned for this Melissa part. Um, Not very good, except for her name was Heidi. And she was a talent. Scarcely glancing at her lines, her voice projecting well, she acted as if she were Melissa. Melanie began to squirm in her seat. Heidi's only discernible drawback was her appearance. She was a bit chunky and had bad acne. So, of course, Melanie gets the part. (laughs) (laughs) She receives most of the script, um, but not the third act. Um, Susan, Mark, and Jeremy had, Jeremy had found it in an old bookstore, and both Jeremy and Susan say the other one has the only copy of the third act. So that's all weird. Melanie's dad is a salesman and is basically, like, literally never at home. She's been in school for a few weeks at this point, and she legit hasn't seen him this entire time. It's just just weird. But, I mean, not so weird because I don't think we ever see him again in the entire book. So, a quick summary of the play. Uh, Just after World War II, Charles, who's played by Mark, is soon to arrive home from the war, missing an arm. His wife is Rhonda, played by Rindy. Melanie plays their friend Melissa. Jeremy plays Rodney, who is discharged from the military for being buck wild with his gun and just his general self. Rhonda and Rodney have probably been getting it on while Charles has been gone. Tracy is Mary, Charles's sister, and there's all sorts of personality conflicts, and Melissa shoots Rhonda at the end of Act 2. So that's basically it. Um, the first rehearsal, okay, this pissed me off. They aim to get through the first two acts for the first time right. that afternoon. Yeah. Apparently they do, aside from a party scene. But there's no way they get the blocking done for that much of the script that fast. Right. Just no way. The sun is still out when they finish. Right. No. (laughs) Also, the gun. So they're using a real gun of Jeremy's. A Smith & Wesson 38 and blanks. They just carry it all around, leaving it all around the set just real casual, like like it's fine. It's just blanks. Okay. <laughs> so a real gun, you could probably guess, should never, ever, ever be used, even with blanks. Um, even like prop guns that you can buy from prop warehouses and stuff um, with blanks can be dangerous because like they can um, emit gas from the Uh front and sides and stuff um they're plugged so nothing comes out at the end um or a starter pistol you can use um with primer loads which i'm pretty sure is what 
we used in the one show where we had a important prop gun and used it a lot. I'm pretty sure that's what we used. Um, it's still real and potentially dangerous, but, um, okay. So I'm going to go off of my experience of that show, but it was 11 years ago. So I might be a little bit hazy. Which show? Um, it was postmortem. Okay. Directed by my brother. And you guys used a pistol? A starter pistol. Starter yes, pistol. I'm pretty sure. So like like one that's they use at track meets. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But it still looks totally real and right. it's heavy and yeah. Um, my ex was also in the show and he was also a pyrotechnician, so that was pretty handy because um, he was basically in charge of loading and unloading every night and like trading those of us who had to use it. Um, and then the stage manager was in charge of it during rehearsals and shows um, when it wasn't on stage too. Um, we also informed the police department whenever we were going to be firing it because <laughs> it was two blocks away. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the theater's right downtown, so right. gunshots, yeah. Yeah, but we always let them know that. Um, there was this one point, though. <laughs> uh, at one point, my sister-in-law, <laughs> real-life sister-in-law, had was behind me grabbing my hair and held the gun to my head. And I swear to God, every night she held it right at my temple, which you are not supposed to do. And it scared the shit out of me. I didn't mm. have to act during that scene at all. <laughs> oh, another funny thing is the first night we were re- rehearsing that with the gun, they'd set my two-month-old niece up on the corner of the stage. And I hope to God that's not one of her first memories is her mom holding a gun <laughs> to her aunt's head. <laughs> like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> But when I had to use it, um, I, you fire up stage just slightly. And the guy mm. I was shooting at was like through the door by then anyway. So it wasn't scary for me to shoot at it. Right. Um, but this one night, the gun just didn't go off. Mm-hmm. And it, I mean, during a performance. Oh. It was awful. I've never been more embarrassed on stage in my life. I mean, I just kept shooting okay. and shooting it. Maybe it came off once. I don't remember. But I it was. I have a kind of similar. Awful. Uh-huh. When I was in the Air Force doing um, Honor Guard, mm-hmm. and we used to do the 21 oh, no. gun salute. Oh, no. <laughs> and we had discussed that morning how um, a lot of the a lot of the time um, some of the guns would not go off while uh-huh. we were shooting. And so we had made a plan to meet the next week to really clean the guns mm. and to go through Um, Because we used blanks, but a lot of them were just um, old used shells, and they were in pretty bad condition. So we were going to go through the shells and Ah, get the ones that looked like they were not going to fire correctly. So we were at a funeral, and I was doing the ready aim fire, Uh and none of the guns went off. None of them? Zero of the guns went off. None of them. That was embarrassing. Oh, my God. Yes. So I just... Oh, no. You know, I didn't know what to do, so I just went through the motions again. You know, there's seven of us, and we're supposed to fire three times, and that's the 21-gun salute. Um, Well, this happened on the third one. (gasps) Oh, no, so you gotten 14 off. So we got... Well, or how many ever had fired during the first two. And so I just did a fourth, you know, went through uh, and, and had them do a fourth anyway. So, yeah, we had that. Oh, that as, means more. <laughs> as far as like um, theater prop guns, the only thing I really know about them is that um, Brandon Lee died right. from yeah. one, which was an actual prop gun. Yeah. And it had a, uh, it, it had, it fired the tip of a dummy round that was accidentally lodged in the chamber. And that was yep. the day before they completed film. Right. Only, only days before they completed film. Yeah. And, yeah, we talked about that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was brought up a lot, you know. That happened the... before you guys? Yeah, that happened in, like, 93, 93 or something. 93, yeah. 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 <laughs> Back when I was reading this, actually, probably. Yeah. 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 Yeah, they were very nonchalant. They were so nonchalant with a fucking real real gun. 
I don't care if it's blanks. That could still fuck somebody up real bad. So, and, yeah, the whole gun situation, I just, just, I can't deal. But, I mean, it wouldn't be much of a plot otherwise. Right. Um, but, yep. But Mark gives Melanie a ride home after that super quick rehearsal. Uh, Tracy was also in the truck and bitchy, but he drops her off first. And Mark and Melanie go to Pizza Hut, and she asks them to the Sadie Hawkins dance. And they go together, and Jeremy and Susan go as friends, and it's like this Western farm themed. Did I did I go to the only school that never had a Sadie Hawkins dance? Oh, I never heard of actually one. I've only read of them um, or seen them on TV. Books, TV, yeah. all the time. You, you Sadie think, Hawkins dance yeah, have never thing. actually been to one. I've never actually heard of it. I don't. <laughs> think I've heard my goddaughters go to one. Did like Megan? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah. So, no. yeah, I think it's just this fucked up fictional. <laughs> I don't think it's real. <laughs> Sadie Hawkins Dance is named oh. after the little Abner comic strip character Sadie Hawkins, created by cartoonist Al Cap. In the strip, Sadie Hawkins Day fell on a given day in November. Cap never specified the exact date. The unmarried women of Dogpatch got to chase the bachelors and marry up with the ones that they caught. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> so I guess it's better that it's just asking boys to a dance now, yeah? Yeah, or yeah. yeah. Maybe not now because we don't believe it really. <laughs> well... And yeah, girls should feel comfortable asking guys to dances Obviously. on any of the dances, not just Obviously. Sadie Hawk dance. Yeah. And me as a shy guy, would wish have, that girls yeah. would have asked instead of. I never would have been able to do it, but yeah. yeah. I think if I just been the type of person to do so, it wouldn't have mattered if it was a regular dance. Like, I feel like, you know. Girls would ask. We didn't have, like, you know, like the whole structure around only guys can ask girls, yeah. I don't think. Yeah, I don't remember I mean, it being a big deal. I think I think like I remember, mid-90s. like, having conversations with, with uh, girls that were friends at that age. Mm-hmm. And they were like, well, that's the guy's responsibility. Oh. Yeah. You were also there in were Texas. A lot of, yeah, there were a lot of gender role, yeah. role specific things. So Tracy was being a total bitch, of course, during this entire dance. And (laughs) Melanie said, Tracy was continually encountering complete bitches and complete bastards. They chased her throughout the universe. Too bad Melissa didn't murder Mary instead of poor Rhonda. (laughs) They got to the reservoir after the dance, which is apparently where all the kids go. And Mark clearly doesn't want to. But he and Melanie go for a walk and start making out. And she keeps messing that up because she's, like, fucking obsessed with him and Rindy ever being together. Even though they weren't because she was his best friend, Clyde's girlfriend. And she's, right now, in the woods smoking. Maybe watching them. Super cool and creepy. (laughs) Um, The end of that night, Susan gives her act three. Um, and we learn that Charles tricks Melissa into telling the truth about murdering Rhonda, so she blows her brains out at the end of the play. I don't really know why that had to be kept a secret for whatever, however long before she gave her act three. But three weeks later is opening night. Uh, Rindy and Melanie get into costume and makeup together. Uh, during rehearsals, the whole awkwardness from the accident last spring slipped away, and they weren't really friends but they, they could tolerate each other for the rehearsals and yeah it sounded like they were kind of becoming friends yes yeah. Yeah. yeah they they put it behind them and it was pretty they seemed cool carl shows up in, with a dozen roses for her for his sister rindy in the dressing room and he asks if she would mind just 11 and takes one and gives it to Melanie. Carl is sweet, but that was giving you suspicions. So. And again, yeah. I thought he was going to be the murderer. <laughs> Heidi, the fat actress, um, busts in with a bone to pick with Susan. Um, she didn't get these free tickets in exchange for keeping her mouth shut, <laughs> not annoying Susan about the auditions and stuff. So Susan gives her a few and tells her to leave. 
Uh, Heidi elbows past Susan on the way out, and she knocks this box of blanks that Susan had been holding out of her hands. Heidi, Susan, and Melanie that start picking up all the bullets. And Melanie had already bought a box on her own um, from football bro, Steve. He works at a place. (laughs) He hooked her up. Um, And she tells Susan this to save him the trouble of crawling around on the floor. And Susan agrees to use Melanie's instead. Tracy, who... Did we say that she was Clyde's sister? I don't think so. Clyde, the quarterback, Mark's best friend. She's his little sister. Anyway, she's messing with the bottles of booze that Rindy's character, Rhonda, is supposed to drink during the show. She puts real whiskey in the mini fridge on the stage. And the curtain rises, act one goes on, everything goes well for that. So between acts, uh, Melanie sees Mark backstage um, since they're smooching at the reservoir um, after the dance, nothing else has happened between them uh, until now. And he kisses her in the dressing room. I don't think Melanie needs all that before she goes back out on the stage, but whatever. Yeah, he kissed her as she was, like, messing with the bullets and stuff. Uh-huh. So, again, like, kind of suspicious. Like, kinda what's he suspicious. doing? Yeah. yeah. During Act 2, there's the curtain comes down. While they change their costumes, and we're at the murder scene. Melanie fires the pistol as they'd rehearsed at Rindy, and Rindy seems, like, genuinely scared um, through, like, their whole scene, and she yells no when Melanie uh, fires the pistol. And so don't. Don't. No. Don't. Don't. Um, Which was part of the script, but then she was supposed to follow up with something else. Yeah. Like something. But we were I thought we were friends. Yeah. 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 Um, But she didn't say that. And Mark, as Charles, rushes out to check the body. uh, And he says she's dead. But he says it is Mark. Because Rindy has actually been shot to death. The next chapter begins with Melanie in a jail cell. Um, Her father's on a sales trip, so her mom had to post bail for her, and she's not happy about it. We meet Captain Crosser. I guess he's a detective? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, And he tells her that a wad cutter, not a blank, had been loaded into the gun, and that's what caused Rindy's death. Um, And Melanie's fingerprints were all over it. Spend some time questioning her, um, and they seem to, like, strike up a little rapport, um, and he lets her go for now. And when she gets home, her mom calls, and she is super pissed about that $10,000 bail fee and about having to pay for Melanie's lawyer. (laughs) His name, this isn't going to be funny to you yet. The lawyer's name is Claudia Schaefer. So you know Claudia Kishi from Babysitter's Club. In the next book we're reading, we meet Don Schaefer. Yeah. yeah, so this name was very weird. <laughs> um, anyways, Melanie acts like it's a huge hassle to explain to her mom what happened. Nobody's taking this very seriously at all. I mean, they're taking it seriously monetarily, but nobody seems concerned. Melanie doesn't seem concerned that she's been accused of murder, and her mom doesn't, she only seems to care about the money. And it's like, what is going on? But then uh, her mom says, it's a good thing her dad has full custody. Because if Rindy's family sues, there's nothing for them to take. I don't exactly know where this fit in, but I pulled this quote um, after Melanie learns about the autopsy. Autopsy. They'd already cut Rindy open like a side of beef. And she had been so beautiful. (laughs) (laughs) So, Rindy's funeral is uh, the day after, and Melanie creeps on it from behind some bushes with binoculars. Like, that's not at all suspicious. Hmm. <laughs> no other young people are there. Oh, you left out the part where part? Rindy's mom punches her in the face. Oh, yeah, Rindy's mom punched her in the <laughs> face. <laughs> so, I'm pretty sure she figured out she wasn't welcome at the funeral. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but creeping on it, come on. That's not a good look. You should have just stayed away. (laughs) Anyway, there are no other high school kids there aside from Carl, Mark, and Susan. 
Afterward, Mark, uh, not Mark. Afterward, Carl takes a walk and Melanie follows him. And Carl tells her how if he's out of town and people see Rindy's picture in his wallet, they ask if it's his girlfriend and he says, no, it's his sister. Girlfriends come and go, but sisters are forever. It's like the one moment of true sincerity in the whole book. But if you were all suspicious of him, it probably didn't come off as <laughs> sincere, did it? No. <laughs> Poor Carl. <laughs> Carl tells Melanie all about Rindy and Co- Clyde's accident. Rindy and Clyde were like the golden couple of the school. Clyde was like this big, you know, quarterback on the football team. And Rindy's his rich, beautiful girlfriend. And he says, the girls envied her and the guys resented her because they couldn't have her. She couldn't win. It's weird how no one was jealous of Clyde. People are weird. People live in a patriarchal society. That's, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's what we're taught to do. Be jealous of other girls. And yeah. Um, one night after a drunken party, they spent um, a lot of time wondering where... The ducks in the reservoir go just like Holden did in The Catcher in the Rye in the winter. Have you read Catcher in the Rye? I don't believe I have. Wow. No. You would have really jammed on it back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. I can't stand it now. Holden Koff is a (laughs) terrible person, but yeah, I loved it back in the day because he talked a lot about, you know, people being phonies and stuff. But Yeah, I'm surprised I haven't read it because I, I did at one time go through and read a lot of things like that. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of Dickens and uh, For Whom the Bell Tolls mm-hmm. and, um, you know, a lot of classics. Mm-hmm. But that's not one of them. I, just, I mean, he's super relatable as a teenager. Yeah. Um, but yeah, read it now and it's just, whew. He's just an annoying little sh- rich <laughs> shit. And yeah. But anyways, he wonders where the ducks go in the winter um, in Central Park. Um, if somebody comes up and collects them or if they fly away or what. And he like obsesses over it. And it's a metaphor, of course, but for like his growing maturity and stuff. But anyways, that's not important to this book. They want to go out to the reservoir and see if the ducks are there. But there's icy roads, and the car, Rindy's, Rindy's driving the car, and Ca- Clyde is uh, seatbeltless, and they, you know, run off the road, and Rindy's not hurt, but Clyde is paralyzed from the waist down. Oh, no. And it's the saddest thing in the world that their quarterback, that's the most important thing, <laughs> is now hurt. And now, uh, Mark quits the football team, too, because his bestie's not there. And Clyde moves out of town to this place called the Teller Home, which I guess is like a rehabilitation place or something. But he doesn't want to come back home. Anyways, um, he prefers it there. Clyde said, oh, God, the names in this stupid book. Carl says his legs are wasted, but he has some use of his arms. It's been almost a year. I hear he's well enough to leave the hospital. He stays, I think, because he doesn't want to have to deal with everybody's sympathy. Immediately after this, Melanie goes, but what about me? I'm in a lot of trouble. (laughs) Jesus fucking Christ, Melanie. Have some empathy. Jesus. So Melanie's hearing starts off well. Um, but then, uh oh, up pops a letter she'd written to that ex boyfriend in San Francisco. She'd written to him about being cast in the play and how she got to kill that awful girl who hit her car last spring. Um, Captain Crosser had found it and he had to turn it over. Um, Melanie's really upset, obviously. He, she thought he was on her side. But he's working for the hangman. Jesus Christ, it's his fucking job, yeah. Melanie. What are you doing? He God, know you're you. dumb. He don't know you. I mean, like I said, they, they struck up a little rapport. But my God, it's his fucking job. It's evidence. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like he wants to know if somebody killed her. But yeah. you know, he doesn't know you. He don't know you. You're still on the suspect list. Melanie? Shit. <laughs> So back at school, nobody's going to talk to Melanie. Um, It makes her feel closer to Rindy. Susan invites her out to have lunch in her car. 
And they go through this whole list of suspects of who could have planted the wad cutter and planned to kill Rindy. And Susan goes, you know, I can't believe this is you talking, Melanie. Hmm. You've changed. I mean, she's going to trial for murder, Susan. Yeah, she's yeah. fucking changed. Yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> what do you expect from her? So Melanie gets all busy conducting her own investigation, you know, since I guess Captain Crosser's not on her side right. anymore. <laughs> she talks to Heidi after cheerleading practice, and she says Heidi was a member of the cheerleading squad, her chunky hips and bad acting notwithstanding. <laughs> now I want her to go to jail. <laughs> Fucking Melanie. <laughs> Well, let's not all put this on Melanie. Let's put some of this on the author. I know, I know. But that's not as much fun. Huh. No, Christopher Pike's terrible. But then Heidi says, she laughs and says, are you saying I killed Rindy so I could have Clyde? That's absurd. He can't even walk. He's a basket case. <laughs> now I want her in jail, you ableist <laughs> little bitch. <laughs> She also talks to Tracy and to Steve, the football bro who sold her that box of blanks. And then she adds a new suspect to her list. All of them working together. Huh. Girl, this is not murder on the Orient Express. Calm your tits. Christopher Pike is no <laughs> Agatha Christie. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Sorry for murder on the <laughs> Orient Express. <laughs> um. Melanie goes to find Mark at his job at the town like 30 minutes away um, at the freight loading terminal. And like, it's basically just a waste of gas. Nothing any good really happened. Um, except for this gem where uh, Mark says, Rindy liked you. All of us could see that when your trial starts. We'll tell the judge that you'll be all right. <laughs> is this just a shit works. ton of white privilege going yeah, on or what works. what <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> but from there goes to visit jeremy at his house he doesn't come to the door so she just goes right in yep um upstairs in his room it's like really fucking weird it's a good way to get shot in texas for real right you know he has a gun yeah um <laughs> But his room's just like a mat on the floor with some blankets and some cameras and a couple VCRs and TV. She sees a tape case labeled Final Chance. That's the name of the play, by the way. I don't think I said that. (laughs) So she's like, remembers that Jeremy was going to video the opening night. Um, And so she presses play on it. And Jeremy appears creepily behind her. And he sits on the floor and they watch the first act. First and second act together. Oh, they fast forward to the murder scene. And Melanie realizes that this video, up until the shooting, is opening night. But then it's dubbed over with dress rehearsal footage. And Jeremy says some buck wild weird things. And he probably just needs to get counseling. Um, This boy was obsessed with Rindy to, like, a scary amount. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, he's real, real weird. Yeah, and what he ended up doing would have gotten him put in jail. Mm, I mean, he basically tampered with evidence. Tampered, that's the word, yeah. Yeah, and would have made him a prime suspect. Absolutely. She adds Dan Russell, the writer of the play, as number eight on her list. So then she leaves Jeremy's house and goes to visit Clyde at the Teller home. The nurse on duty calls up his room, but he won't see a visitor that he doesn't know, which, I mean, yeah. Um, So Melanie writes him a note to convince him to help her solve Rindy's murder. But guess what? Clyde didn't know that Rindy's dead. (laughs) (laughs) So he freaks the fuck out and he has to be sedated and Melanie's kicked out of the home, which, yeah, dumbass. So she drives to Kansas City to go to this bookstore where they found the script for Final Chance. And she finds another copy of the play, but it's a new-looking photocopy. Uh, So she decides to call the copyright office in D.C. and finds out that Stan Russell has no registered public works. (laughs) She says, It was located in Washington, D.C. She had to charge the call to her home phone. Her dad was going to wonder what was going on. I think he's got some bigger worries about you right now, girl. (laughs) 
I mean, I get long distance was a way bigger deal back in oh, yeah. eight, but yeah. not bigger than murder. As, as my mom <laughs> could attest with my brother. Oh, <gasps> what did he do? Is he talking to girls? Yes. And he had like a $400 phone bill. And we were so, so poor. We were so yeah. poor. And that was probably about 88 or so, maybe? Yes. 88, 89. How much that would be now? And so she told him, you cannot do this anymore. You know, she was already, she was working nights for the prison uh-huh. and raising two boys on her own. My dad my dad gave her a hundred and seventy five dollars a month for child support um and yeah, the rest of it was from her, yeah, her working at the prison and uh was a low position at the time, yeah, and just you know she couldn't afford that, no, so she called the phone company and got them to set up a payment plan so she could pay it off, wow. And the next month, there was a $500 no. phone bill. Yes. Your brother is dumb. And I'm sorry, Todd, if you ever hear this, but boy, you were dumb. So <laughs> that's what caused them to have a big fight in which she told him, if you're not going to listen, I can't have you live in my house anymore. That's fair. And that's when he had to leave. Wow. I think he was a, I think he was a junior in high school at the time. Wow. No, Hornier. I was a freshman, so he would have been, yeah, a junior, junior, junior yeah. in high school. Yeah. $500 is 1048 Yeah. Now. Wow. Yeah, that was probably, that was like, probably close to, I mean, she probably made, um, she probably made about seventeen or $18,000 a year. Yeah. At that time, so. I mean, those two phone bills were close to, close to a month's salary. God damn. Yeah. But still not worse than murder. Still not worse than murder. <laughs> but pretty fucking bad. I mean, <laughs> if she murdered him, I wouldn't have blamed her. Yeah. But, you know, whatever. But when she gets home from Kansas City, she calls up her old buddy, Captain Crosser. And together they go over the suspect list, um, which is everyone who is in the plate. What? What is he doing? He's not doing his job very well. Yeah, he should not be talking about the an, uh, no. ongoing investigation with the prime suspect. No! Ugh. So, <sighs> Melanie then suggests that the cast reperform the play to help them find the killer. <laughs> and so they do a week and a half later. Um, the only difference is that uh, since Rindy's dead, Melanie's going to play Rhonda and Susan will play Melissa. And on stage, Melanie begins to wonder if Rindy had possibly planted the wad cutter herself in a suicide type. Um, attempt because like nobody in school liked her after mm-hmm. Clyde's accident and all that. And after Melanie's character is killed, uh, she watches the third act from backstage. They do all this in front of an audience. Yeah. That is not fucking necessary to reenact this play. Yeah, it's like they or to not even only, do the third act. What the, are you? They not only force these kids to do because a lot of them didn't want to do it. No. They not only force these kids to go through this again, to to act in this play again, they sell tickets to it. Yeah. It's like, hey, let's profit <laughs> yeah. off this train wreck of murder. Just, yeah. What? <laughs> and, I mean, these uh, they, some of the other kids should have trauma from this. Yes. I mean. Yeah. I mean, they, none of them seem to. No. But. They said they, it seems like they, <laughs> they come there hoping that it happens again. Yeah. I mean, I guess I can't, <laughs> I can't blame the audience members so much. You know, they're in Caraville, Iowa. There's not a lot else <laughs> going on. But, yeah. Anyone involved? What? What? Ugh. Anyway, she wanted to see what. She want, she had wanted to see out of Rindy's eyes. And now, even if it was all just make-believe, they had shared the same death. Hmm. How close could two people get? Yeah. Girl, you didn't die. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> but how close can you get to somebody than murdering? So, but during that whole, while she's watching the third act, Melanie, like, basically convinces herself that Rindy killed herself. Um... 
That night, Melanie has a dream about this beautiful girl in a basement playing Scrabble. And the girl gives Melanie ten tiles, even though that's not normally how many you use. Um, But she tells her to create two names with them. And Melanie realizes this girl is Rindy. And so she starts to form Stan Russell, the author's name, out of the tiles. But the telephone wakes her up before she can figure out the other name. And it's good old Captain Crosser telling him he wants to see Melanie at the station at 1 p.m. It's 9 a.m. now, and he asks her, you know, what she's doing in the in-between time. And she's like, oh, staying home, probably going to clean some. And he's like, yeah, that sounds good. And then he explicitly says that she should drive straight to the police station later. So, of course, when Susan calls to help, <laughs> to ask her to help her and Mark strike the set, she goes right on out. Yeah. I cannot deal with this bitch. I just cannot. <laughs> And Mark's not there, so Melanie and Susan get started. Um, And, of course, they're talking, and Melanie gets all blabby and tells Susan how she thinks Rindy planted the wad cutter herself and how that could have happened and how depressed uh, Rindy had seemed, Um, how she probably felt guilty about Clyde and no one in school liked her. And so, naturally, she'd want to shoot herself, obviously. Um, As they work, sorting out props and everything, uh, Melanie thinks back to her dream from that morning. And she realizes Stan Russell can also be formed into Susan Trells. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. (laughs) So she, you know, starts to panic pretty hardcore and uh, tries to open this emergency door to set off the fire alarm, forgetting that Carl had rigged it. Okay, this is another one of the stupid ass things. For this fridge on stage, um, Susan wanted to just have the light from the fridge during the murder scene, which does sound very dramatic and nice. Mm-hmm. Um, not mad about that. But they didn't need a working fridge on right. set. They could have just put a light in there. Right. Because the power that the fridge pulls fucks with all the electricity. And so it makes it so the emergency door won't go off when opened. But I'm just like, I can't imagine the stupidity of running a fridge. A, that would make noise. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, pulling so much power. The hitter can't afford that. Yeah. <laughs> and then obviously the safety issues with right. the emergency door. Anyway, so Melanie... Tries to open it, and Susan notices and tells Melanie uh, how the alarm's disabled. Susan had discovered that during a previous um, production. So they're using this fridge all the damn time, (laughs) this stupid little stage. I know it's for the plot of the story, but it's just, oh, God, it's dumb. So Susan figures that Melanie's figuring all this out, so she pulls a gun on her, of course, and starts to explain her whole big plan. Susan loved Clyde um, so much that she needed to kill Rindy. Rindy's fear wasn't because she planted a wad in. It's because she knew she was going to die. Because it was Susan that stood behind Melanie, hidden in the wings, and shot her the same time that Melanie, as Melissa, fired her gun on the second shot, I believe. It was so close to Melanie that it, like, shot a hole in her nightgown that she was wearing. Mm -hmm. But... And I mean, like, Melanie noticed it, but, like, she didn't think anything of it. So Susan's holding the gun up to her, and (laughs) Melanie starts wondering, worrying about her hair. (laughs) She's like, my hair, I should have washed it. The coroner would think I was a slob when he tries to take the bullet out of my skull. Mm, Yeah. (laughs) I mean, I guess when you're in danger, your mind can do weird-ass things, but that (laughs) that made me laugh more than anything. But guess what? Melanie had put the other gun from under the couch cushion. um, Under the couch cushion she's sitting on when they were doing... So there ends up being three guns, right? Okay, that's what I was trying to figure out. I didn't want to go back and look. But did they release... I think they released his gun back to him. Which, no fucking way. No, I think they have the gun... I think there ends up being three. Okay. No, because Susan bought that one. 
The one she's holding right the now? The one that she's holding, yes. Right. That she ends up shooting because she talks about how easy it was to, to buy. Right. Yeah, because yeah, she yeah, bought yeah. it at like a gun show, y'all. And <laughs> Jeremy had two of them because you have to have two of everything. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I forgot about that. But okay. But anyways, hey, background checks. Gun shows. Let's do it. Anyway. <laughs> So she whips out this gun, and Melanie does, and they both shoot at each other a little bit, and they both get hit, but it's fine. Um, they somehow still manage to, like, have a knockdown drag out fight. A skirmish. <laughs> a skirmish. That's a good word, too. <laughs> oh, this amused me, too. Um, Melanie calls Susan a bitch, and then a few seconds later, Susan calls her a little pipsqueak. <laughs> Anyways, the lights go out, and they're, like, fighting in the dark and shit, and Melanie uh, picks up this lamp and hits susan in the head with it and it makes a really gross mushy sound (laughs) he described that well that was nasty but the lights come back on and clyde wheels into the auditorium and susan confesses that she killed rindy because rindy ruined clyde before this one person crippled as he was susan was ashamed the ableism in this book (laughs) is fucking killing me (laughs) especially now that I'm pretty much having to be in a wheelchair all the time. And this, I mean, it didn't actually make me feel like shit, but it's like, wow. Wow. We're... Mm, what's this the word? disease has ruined you. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> Were impressions of disabled people so different in the 80s that that was acceptable? Um, I would think so. I mean, there was no, there was no um, like ADA requirements, right? Right. So that they didn't, didn't come until have 91. to. So they didn't, they didn't have to allow people to have access. <laughs> I mean, they still don't. Yeah. But yeah. Well, there wasn't even that. Yeah. Right. I just wonder, you know, terminology and saying, you know, I think, someone's ruined. Yeah. I think there's a, a, a stigma that is, is still there even today. Oh, absolutely. Um, with disability and. You know, like like the article we were reading that was talking about, well, um, handicapped spaces should only be before dark because if you're handicapped, you don't need to be out. Handicapped people should only be out between the hours of 8 and 5, yeah. was a tweet some guy did a few months ago. And yeah. that was just, it's okay. The disabled there's, there's community came down people, on him hard. <laughs> yeah, there are still people who believe things like that. Yeah. 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 But... I don't believe that sort of thing would be able to be published in a young adult book today. Mm. <laughs> Anyways, Clyde has a story for Susan. Uh, Rindy wasn't the one driving that night. After the crash, um, Rindy was able to switch places with Clyde. Um, so that way his family could sue her. Her family. Since they were rich and Clyde's was poor. That way poor Clyde's poor family wouldn't be burdened by him. And her rich family would never meet the money, never miss the money. I hate the word burden like that. Yeah. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, let's get real. I'm feeling a lot of that right now myself. And that's not with anybody putting that on me. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that word kind of hurt. Christopher Pike, thanks. If I told the truth, she warned, I'd be a burden on my family till the day I died. I truly hope no disabled kids read this. Anyway, Susan goes, I could kill you. And he goes, and put me out of my misery? Don't do me any favors. I mean, it's just like, <laughs> hit you over the head like Susan did with the lamp. With <sighs> the ableism. Anyway, Susan pretends to shoot herself in the head. Um, just as Captain Crosser and everyone else, like, burst in there. But she didn't really. Uh, she, like, injures herself, but she didn't, like, kill herself. So we see everybody a few weeks later. Um, Clyde has come back to school because apparently he's all good now. I don't know. Oh, Jeremy admits he had his suspicions about Susan from the beginning uh, since the play imitated real life so closely. And he does tell him how on his video a flash of orange had appeared behind Melanie. And Jeremy knew there was a second shot fired. So, But he couldn't let that happen. He couldn't let Susan get in trouble. Boy. Wow. He needs to see a therapist or something. Yeah. This boy's messed up. And he was willing to let her go to jail. Yeah. Knowing, after having seen evidence, yeah. that it wasn't her. 
Yeah. But they all just kind of forgive him. He's like, oh, that's crazy, Jeremy. Yeah. Speaking of ableist language, but yeah. Oh, but apparently Susan's only 17, so she's going to be tried as a juvenile. I doubt that. Yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, back then. Premeditated murder? Come on. Yeah, back then they were they were um, trying even like 13 and 14-year-olds as oh. adults. Oh. Yeah. But she's a white was, girl. If it was a bad enough crime. Yeah. Um, but like she said, um, because of the, how good she can act, no jury would ever convict her. I mean, normally I wouldn't believe that, but with all these stupid ass people, <laughs> <laughs> they're fucking like lead detective, just like talking yeah, yeah. to everybody. Yeah. Maybe she might get off with it. So all the other kids visit, go up and visit the re- reservoir, and good old Captain Crosser's there. This epilogue is just its just so much fucking exposition. I basically skimmed it, except for this bit. Captain Crosser knew it was Susan after the redo performance, and Melanie's like, well, why didn't you arrest her then? He looked embarrassed. I should have. I considered it. But when I watched her sitting and taking off her makeup and smiling innocently, I said to myself... This can't be. I was swayed by her charm. He is the actual worst at his job. (laughs) Oh, my God. Fire this man immediately. Holy fuck. But to get some closure on the ducks, uh, the local local diner owner, Melanie's old boss, Sam, is taking all the ducks away in a boat for for the winter. And Jeremy takes some silly photos of the group with his Polaroid camera and Carl wants to put one of Melanie in his wallet like he did with Rindy. Ah. So after having reviewed this, mm-hmm. I've got to change it to a five. <laughs> okay. Did you miss some things when you were reading it quickly? Yeah, just, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, too many It's things. really bad. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, man, but man, back in the day, I loved it. I don't know how many times I read it. Okay, so just where the fuck are all the adults in this fucking book? We hear from her bitchy mom twice on the phone. Or we hear about her having talked to her mom twice on the phone. There's literally the one scene with her dad. Maybe he's there during her meetings with her lawyer, He's mentioned, but I mean, I don't think he ever speaks again, <laughs> other than like a few weeks into school. <laughs> right. Um, but the most problematic, where the fuck is the drama teacher? Or the teachers we in general. We never meet the drama teacher. Right. Ever. Bullshit. I mean, yes. Okay. Like, kids will have opportunities to direct in high school mm-hmm. theater. Sure. But... The teachers are around and I mean you know, they don't like even say they don't even say that the teacher is like sitting in an office somewhere no. smoking a cigarette or something. It's no. just non-existent. Nothing. It's it's just let these kids have free reign of the school, doing their rehearsals and absolutely no adult adult supervision. Yeah. That is buck fucking wild, <laughs> fucking wild, and I understand this was before as much security mm-hmm. in schools and stuff. Um, because of shootings and everything, but still. But I just can't believe that never there to oversee things. And I mean, right. It's like, especially he just, he's just like, okay, if I'm not directing it, I have nothing to do with that, this play. That, that, I'm not, not going to be happen. there during the play. I'm not going to be there during rehearsals. Mm-mm. I'm not going to oversee anything. Nothing. That is such bullshit, and it bothered the shit out of me. I don't think it did back when I was younger, which is ridiculous, because I was doing school plays and stuff. I mean, not high school, where we had our kids directing, but still, that... What the hell? What the hell? (laughs) What the hell? Okay, this was interesting. Um, So, a lot... Christopher Pike has written, like, a ton of... Um, young adult scary books which I found this one interview with him and it was apparently because his publisher said hey we're teen horror books are like a thing so 
can you write one? And he just like threw it together like real quick. And yeah, that's how we started doing it. He had no like love for it or anything, mm. but so it just kind of happened. But and paid bills. Yeah. Uh, and then he, you know, got pretty. That's not his real name, by the way. His mm. real name is Kevin McFadden. That's his name. Anyway, so pretty much all the leads of his books are white girls, attractive white girls. And it's kind of understandable, uh, and they point this out in the interview, that like, that was during like the Sweet Valley High years, and Mm. when we get to that, I mean, they start like, they start like every book saying how they're the perfect size six, and blue-eyed, and blonde-haired, and so it was kind of expected. But, okay, I want to read you this. It's a long quote about it, um, but it's interesting. He says, It was impossible to write young adult in the 80s and 90s and not notice that the covers all had pretty white girls on them and little else. When Simon & Schuster began to publish my books, they were very open with me. They told me I could write what I wanted as long as I sold tons of books. Um, I thought it was time I addressed a few of the stereotypes I was seeing in the field. My first book there was Last Act, this very book we're reading. And he asked if he could, I asked if I could make the main character a normal looking girl. I didn't want her to resemble a model. That worked out fine. If you remember, the only things wrong wrong with her was being 5'2 and her bottom teeth were crooked. Mm-hmm. Anyways, um, <laughs> that worked out fine. And two books later, he did. I did the Final Friends trilogy and created two important characters that were not Caucasian. It may seem silly nowadays, but I felt kind of proud of myself to have a black guy and a Latina young woman on the cover of my books. But then I ceased pushing for a variety of races to play my characters. Was it laziness? I don't know. Maybe. In fact, I don't think it was uh, until Fall Into Darkness was published in conjunction with Tatiana Ali, starring in a movie of the week that I had some color on one of my covers. Uh, That wasn't Simon & Schuster's fault. It was my fault. I was very popular during that period, and I could have insisted on the race of my characters. I could have added some some color to the entire young adult aisle, but I didn't. I let the whole thing slide. I wish I hadn't. I just thought that was interesting, because he's like, uh, but it doesn't seem sincere. It feels like he's saying, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. But Yeah, I mean, I can see him making a conscious choice, thinking that his audience was of a specific color mm. and deciding that he would rather have the money in the cells than mm-hmm. he would make a statement. And, yeah. you know, only, like, years later would he say, oh, I wish I had. Yeah, once he was asked about it. Yeah. Now. Yeah, it just seems like, you know, it was lazy and it was easy to do. Just pretty white. Pretty white girls. Yeah, this was from earlier this year. So. I don't really look yeah. around the adult the young adult sections is that uh-huh. still the same or has that gotten better um the ones i read are definitely more diverse yeah uh, not only with race but um sexuality and gender in different roles mm. and yeah good yeah yeah this sort of stuff would never fly now yeah. i was thinking about that earlier was i thinking this book was just crappy because i'm an adult now but then i realized no i still read a lot of current young adult mm. And no, (laughs) they're all good. This is just terrible. (laughs) So that's my final thought on last act. It was terrible. (laughs) (laughs) Any more thoughts from you? Um, No, I think we've pretty much covered up. Okay, well, happy when you hear this belated World Theater Day, everybody. (laughs) But hey, there's a lot of bad theater out there. But you know what? It's all important. Yep, support your arts. Support the arts. And also, hey, could 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 you help us support us? <laughs> <laughs> um, I was looking at our stats this Speaking week. Speaking of supporting the arts. Speaking of supporting the arts, podcasting is an art, right? <laughs> I don't know. 
Um, but I was looking at our stats this week and found out we have people listening, like in Russia, in Germany, in France, in the UK, and in Ireland, and that's just like really exciting. So we know you're out there. Why don't, why don't you come say hi to us? Um, talk to us on Twitter and Facebook, and most importantly, please start giving us some reviews on iTunes. Um, that would be amazing, and we would really, really appreciate it. Um, Is it okay if they give us, like, really shitty reviews? I mean, if you think we're shitty, let us know, and we'll try <laughs> to do better. We'll try to take your criticism and thoughts and listen to it and apply it. But trolls can just fuck right Oh, trolls can right fuck off. right off. We can tell the difference. <laughs> Unless you're one of the furry-headed trolls. Not the new ones, though. The 90s ones that were naked. Ah, yeah. yeah. Anyways. Because that's nostalgic. It is. I had a lot of troll dolls, and I would, like, make clothes for them. Sixth grade, they were wow. huge in Connecticut. Yeah. Anyways, that's Trolls Cast. <laughs> <laughs> Please rate and subscribe on iTunes and all your other podcast places, like Stitcher and iHeartRadio and Spotify and whatever your preferred podcatcher is. Um, check out our website at fightingoverthecardcatalog.com. Find us on Facebook and Instagram at Fighting Over the Card Catalog. Catch us on Twitter and tweet at us at Card Catalog Pod. Or email us at fightingoverthecardcatalog at gmail.com. Our next book, uh, we're going to delve into The Sleepover Friends with number one, Patty's Luck. Uh, it's a lot shorter than this book. And Stephen needs a bit of a break. It's like 100 pages long, so. <laughs> I yeah, love you. So, so I listen to books during the week. And Dude. I read for pleasure before I go to bed, but I only get like, I usually only get like, you know, a dozen or less pages in a night before I'm too sleepy and go to sleep. So, Do you know how hard I looked for like some audio book version of it for you <laughs> i tried so hard but it does not exist apparently so i tried at least yeah i guess that's the bad thing about the older. going back to old books yeah. because they're not gonna i bet there are some judy blooms and stuff we'll have to look into that when we do more of those yeah i bet more of the actual good literature <laughs> <laughs> there might be audiobooks of Anyways, we'll look into that. I guarantee there's no sleepover, friends. <laughs> mm. But I'll look. I love you. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> Thank God. We're rereading the books of your childhood. So you don't have to. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.